Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and we're here to talk, of course, about Pens taking on the Toronto Maple Leafs on Tuesday, but then they also have three games in the next four days, all on the road, so we're going to break that down a little bit, get into a little bit of Malkin hitting his 1,000th game, even though we are still about three games away. But we're going to start that conversation today. We'll finish it on Monday. But before we do any of that, let's start with Penn's Toronto because the Penguins fell 5-2 to on home ice to a Toronto Maple Leafs team that, at the end of the day, just looked like the better unit. So with that, we have to talk about Teddy Bluger because first 15 games of the season, no Bluger for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He comes in, plays on Tuesday. What did you think of his performance, Horwath? Looked good. Looked stout. Looked like, you know, sometimes obviously it's going to take some time to get under, to get your legs under you. I had said a long time ago that uh, he's not going to come in and immediately be the game changer for Hmm. the penalty kill or the fourth line or whatever it may be. It's going to take him a couple games, maybe just, you know, a couple shifts, a couple games, maybe a week. You never know because it's been so long. And the longer that he was out, the longer it was going to take for him to be fully back into game mode. And, you know, I don't know if he felt fully there the entire game, but he said, you know, a couple shifts in. Obviously, it took me time to get up to it, uh, but he looked fine. You know, you don't expect much from your fourth liner, especially. So the fact that he was able to step right in after missing 15 games and look pretty solid and not, I don't think his line gave up any goals. Um, huh. nope. looks, looked, uh, that's a solid debut from your fourth line center who, I mean, let's be real, you put a lot of faith into. So, um, yeah, you can't be disappointed with uh, his performance uh, at all. 12 minutes even, by the way, of ice time. 12 minutes even, and if I'm not mistaken, the only other stat he logged in that game was one hit. He didn't yeah. have any shots on goal. He didn't have any penalty minutes. He didn't have any blocks, no giveaways, no takeaways, just one hit. And obviously some face-offs, but yes. Well, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, but no, with uh, with the fact that you mentioned that his line didn't give up any goals, they did not. We'll, we'll get to the uh, Crosby line here in a minute, but the Crosby line gave up all five goals on Tuesday. Even Yikes. the empty netter was when Crosby was on the ice. But uh, to close out, Teddy Bluger, like you mentioned, 12 minutes even time on ice. I thought he looked pretty pretty okay uh, for his first game back. First game of the season, realistically. You know, the last actual game action that he played besides, you know, one preseason game against the Columbus Blue Jackets, besides the beauty league where I guess he treated it like an NHL matchup with all the fights and stuff he was doing. The last NHL game that he actually played was game seven against the New York Rangers back in May. So it's going to take a little bit to get his feet underneath him. He even, like you said, mentioned that in that game, I thought he looked pretty good, but what he does bring to this Penguins team is a little bit more pedigree in the bottom six. Cause you had, it was either Ryan Paling or you had maybe even a, a Hollander or a pool land down there. And while some of these guys, yes, they're young and you hope to, for them to have that NHL pedigree moving forward and maybe in the future, they don't have it right now. And Teddy Bluger does. So that's what he brings to the bottom of the lineup. And I'm excited to see what he can do on this road trip. Now that he has that one game underneath his belt and uh, trying to get back into the swing of things, obviously, He's not going to be the offensive contributor that the Penguins need in the bottom six, but he might be able to provide a little bit more in terms of defense and penalty kill. But Stability. How about that? How about some stability down there just to solidify what our bottom six is supposed to look like? I mean, Teddy Bluger made it back. We have our fully healthy roster of forwards. Defense, not yet, but fully healthy roster of forwards. Because Barry Kapanen is nowhere to be found. It. So we need some kind of stability down there, and Teddy Bluger is going to be a name that can do it because, again, you look at the bottom six, Teddy Bluger and Jeff Carter are going to be your centers. Awesome. Brock McGinn happens to be scoring at a weird pace. Sure, fun. And uh, Danton Heinen needs to find his game, but thankfully we're only paying him a million dollars. But then you look at the other two wingers there, uh, Paling and Archibald. Not, maybe shouldn't, not, not, not shouldn't, but maybe weren't going to be in the lineup at the beginning of the season. You know, injuries happened, and then they both made it in, and then Kapanen sucked. So now they're in full time. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So how about some stability that Teddy Bluger also brings to this bottom six as well? Yeah, to this point of the season, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the best bottom six player for the Penguins, or at least most consistent bottom six player for the Penguins, it's been Josh Archibald, and that's yeah. an issue. 
Um, me and Doug Gladkey talked extensively about the Kasperi Kapanen situation on Penguins Lunch yesterday. You can go back onto the podcast feed or onto the YouTube feed and check out that interview where we discussed Kasperi Kapanen for, for a good portion of that show. Uh, so go check that out. But you mentioned the Crosby line earlier. It gave up all five goals on Tuesday, and it would be something, you know, that would be a red flag if, if it was just an isolated performance there. But that's four straight games for that line that they have struggled. I mean, Brian Rust is officially in a slump. Sidney Crosby scored a goal on Tuesday, but that was, it was what happens whenever somebody gives one of the greatest players in the history of the game a really bad turnover and a lot of open space. He makes you pay. So you still see stuff like that. Obviously, Jake Gensel still leads the team in goals with eight, but this has just been an issue with this line at five on five. It's not producing enough. Like we said, in the last four games, not good enough. You look at the numbers, one goal four, which was Crosby's easy goal, basically. Yeah. I mean, you have to still finish, but the puck was handed to him with nobody in front of him. Seven goals allowed, though, in the last four games at five on five. That is simply not good enough. And then you look at their other numbers. Only 42% of the actual shot attempts, 31% of actual shots on goal, and 34% of the expected goals. They're, they're performing like a fourth line. It's yeah. just not good enough. And as we saw in practice on Wednesday, maybe it's time for a change. Yeah, we didn't get any certainty of the change. I know uh, Sullivan just t- talked about it <clears throat> and mentioned that they're just trying to do everything they can to put out a winning formula. Yeah, and that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And if that involves switching uh, Raquel and Rust again, then absolutely you have to go for it. Um, but yeah, this this first line just isn't finishing uh, finishing anything. Yeah, Crosby's going to record that goal. Bob Pompani said it to me in the press box. He said that that first line isn't doing anything. And if, if the leaf he was, I could, we neither of us could remember which leaf it was that just whiffed on that pass. Um, if they don't do that, and by the way, it was very close to being offside. Um, if they don't do that, then we're not even discussing that one goal. Crosby's going to produce. Doesn't matter how good or bad his line is, he's going to still knock in a point or two here and there. It's a matter of becoming difference makers. Brian Russ hasn't scored a point in six games now. Uh, Cindy Crosby and Brian Russ, Brian Russ were both minus fours against the Leafs. Jake Gens was a minus five. That is all five goals. Um, that's not ideal, especially if you look at we we talked about it last episode. Uh, this isn't their first time being a minus four in a game. Mm-hmm. They did it not that long ago. So something does need to change with that line, and it is a matter of just taking the right opportunities and not letting things in you know it's it's a lot of talk about just taking opportunities this year uh well they need to capitalize a little more often and actually get some offense going Mm -hmm. and it's 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 a good thing if you switch everything around for both you know brian rust and for the Sidney crosby unit because we've seen only success really with crosby gensel and raquel Mm -hmm. and, and ricard raquel he likes playing on both wings. You know, he, he has chemistry at this point with both guys and Brian Rust, while he's struggling with Crosby and has had chemistry in the past, it's not like he's starting from scratch with Evgeny Malkin. There's chemistry there and joining a line with Malkin and Zucker who are playing as hard as they will. I mean, they just have to raise the floor of Brian Rust. So I think that is certainly the move that I would go with. I know Mike Sullivan has said going into the season, they were expecting to switch it around pretty often. It's time to switch it back. Yeah. Um, especially with, three games in the next four days, which we'll get into with, with Brian Russ playing at the level he's playing right now. It's going to be hard to win games because you rely on him at this point for offensive output. And I'm not going to lie. The Crosby line at times in that Tuesday game, they did have really good shifts. They had two or three shifts where they were in the offensive zone. They were attacking, but the overwhelming majority was them getting caved in, in their own zone. And you just can't have that if you're the Pittsburgh Penguins, but From the top six at five on five to those top six same players on the power play, I thought it looked better despite going 0 for 3 on Tuesday, and I think you shared the same sentiment. Oh, it just looked better. Sometimes you just catch a vibe and you go, okay, this is better, and it's the fact that they were shooting the puck. Chris Letang was getting shots on goal. Um, They had the Leafs hemmed in the zone the entire, almost the entire two minutes. Yeah, there was still a dump or two, but that's going to happen. It was a matter of the, the fact that they picked up I think it was four shots, maybe three or four shots on goal, not just attempts on that power play. Um, 
but Matt Murray decided to turn into 2016 vintage, apparently. Yeah. Ugh, welcome back to Pittsburgh, I guess. But yeah, it was it looked better and it was something Sullivan said they could build off of that and mm-hmm. they can create their opportunities. And in the practice the following day, it was a very I don't want to say sarcastic vibe on the power play, but they uh there were some jokes going around. The the first unit scored on their first attempt, and you could just hear Brian Russ yelling, We did it, guys. They scored on their second one and just hands up again. It's they they, they know what position they're in. They mm-hmm. are, are aware that that unit needs to be better. And they I mean, this group looks confident. This group looks like they could still do it. Mm-hmm. And on paper, when you have Crosby, Falcon, and Latang throw Gensel out there, they should be scoring every time. Start acting like it. Take shots. At least 30% of the time, which is 30% would be one of the best in, in the NHL. But you should at least be scoring more than they have been. And honestly, even if they're not scoring, they look like they did in some of those power play opportunities on Tuesday. Who's going to complain? Yes, some people are going to be like, wow, if only you would score on that. But it's the momentum of a really good power play that can really build off into really good opportunities at five on five. So if the Penguins can continue to do that, the results will eventually come as well. Uh, But like you mentioned, better possession on Tuesday, better scoring chances on Tuesday. Letang, for the first time, I think definitely all season, but for the first time that I can conceivably remember, he had two shot attempts in the same power play. So that's what you need because you cannot, as we mentioned earlier in the show and, in previous episodes, you can't just take that chess piece off the board by saying he's never going to shoot the puck. Now, whether that's something in the scheme or whether that's something that Latang has been doing on his own, it's something that you need. You need that dimension to the power play because if you don't have it, it makes it supremely easy to cover. What else makes it supremely easy to cover the Penguins power play this season? The movement. Previously, they didn't have any movement. You would just see five guys standing still, passing the puck back and forth like they're playing against just inanimate objects, which they're not. But what we saw on Tuesday was a little bit more movement. Sid up high a little bit more. Malkin switching sides. Brian Russ down below the net. Jake Gensel shifting, coming up into a bumper roll instead of just a net front presence. That's what you need to do to keep these teams on edge because as of right now, the book had been out on the Penguins. This is what they do. They don't move. This is what you do to stop their power play. And it's worked 95% of the time this season. Well, they switched things up against Toronto. They didn't score a goal because of Matt Murray, but mm-hmm. they looked much, much better. And that is what you need to see from the Penguins' power play. But Matt Murray, we got to cl- we're going to close out this segment with him because what an absolute astonishing performance! Not only because it's Matt Murray who has struggled with consistency over the past couple of seasons since the Penguins traded him, and even beforehand with the Pittsburgh organization. But just what a performance coming off of an injury. He has only played one game this season. It wasn't a great game. Then he gets injured in a pregame skate. But he comes back in Pittsburgh, has an amazing performance. And as always, I think it was based out of great positioning from us. Oh, yeah. It was it was one of those storybook re- rebounds, right? He mm-hmm. you know, struggles all the way around since he, like, since he leaves the organization. Injured in a second game with his third team or first game in his, with his new third team. Uh, first game back against his uh, Stanley Cup championship team and shuts them down. And mm-hmm. it's not even like the Penguins got goalied because there was just some something off about the game where, yeah, Matt Murray played phenomenally and was making big saves, but they weren't the Penguins weren't getting the hardest of chances. That power play we just discussed at nauseum was the highlight of our chances, I feel like. There was a couple other great ones, but... Um, Matt Murray stood on his head, but didn't have to stand too much. He was just, like Mm -hmm. you said, great positioning. He was in the net. He was, you know, making the right saves and making all the saves he needed to, to let his team in it and keep, to keep his team in it, to let them win. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was a hell of a comeback game for him. And, you know, honestly, good for him. Man deserves it in this town. Yeah, he he truly does. And honestly, with, with Matt Murray, I'll push back on on two things with his performance that you said there. You said the Penguins didn't test him. Boy, did they test him in the second period, though. Oh, yeah. The Penguins, they got outplayed in the first. They did. Toronto outplayed him. And then in the third, Toronto did exactly what the Penguins did to them on on Friday evening last week. They shut things down. Or as my Twitter page said, they shit things down on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, They just played really good team defense. 
They took the puck down. They dumped it, made the Penguins come 200 feet, and then shut things down in the neutral zone. So I thought Toronto played a really good defensive game in the third, which kept the puck away from the Penguins for the most part and just kept all those chances to the outside for Matt Murray. But I don't know if Matt Murray's back. Listen, it's one game. Uh, it'd be nice to see him come back and be the guy that he was in 2016, 2017. There is no no player or no personality that I think deserves it more than a guy like Matt Murray. He took so much crap for a guy that won back-to-back -back Stanley Cups as basically a rookie in both instances. But I will say one thing. Matt Murray goes up against the Penguins. I'm not sure I could pick the Penguins because now he has made 77 saves on 80 shots and given up three goals in two games played against the Pittsburgh Penguins in his career. That's so tough. That's so tough. I can't, and I also can't believe fans were still giving it to him. I can. I, I can. Five I years can. later. Just, that's just not fair, man. That's not. People are, listen, sports fans can be the best people or they can be the absolute worst people. And most of the time, the ones you hear are the absolute worst people. That's in person, at the games, on Twitter, on Facebook. That's how it goes. The people that are assholes, pardon my French, are the loudest. The people that are the nicest are usually quiet. So, you know, Matt Murray, I'll always stand behind him. Absolutely. And I know you will too. And I know a lot of our listenership will too. You hate to see him do it against the Penguins. You really do. But you got to tip your cap whenever you see a performance like that. And like you mentioned, not very busy in the first and third, but in the second period, he certainly earned that W. Yeah. And honestly, like I said, like, Sure, I wanted to. Sure, I always want the Penguins to win, but you know what? Good for him. Good for yep. Matt Murray, man. Just shut your team, shut your old team down, shut your old fans up or haters up, and go out on top. That's a good, good on him. Obviously, it sucks losing, but man, that's that's a good moment for him. And that second period, he absolutely shut them down. And the Penguins had 15 shots in the third, but it just didn't feel like it, right? They were all from the outside. They were no second chance opportunities. And and he did a good job of swallowing it up and his defense did a good job of clearing the, the net front. So, yeah. I mean, you, you can't, you can't hate on the guy for that. You got to get chances. If you're the Pittsburgh Penguins, you got to break through somehow, but we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to preview this road trip. It's a really quick one. Three games in four days, all on the road for the Penguins. The bags are packed. They're off and ready for tonight in Minnesota. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. The Pittsburgh Penguins, they're still struggling. They're still struggling. And we're getting close to the quarter mark of the season, which is unofficially the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know where the Penguins sit right now in the division. It's not great. I believe they're in seventh, only ahead of the Columbus Blue Jackets by a slim margin. Uh, but they need to turn things around, and, and they're going to have a tough test coming up this weekend. Starting tonight against Minnesota, they have three games in four days, including their third of four back-to-backs in the month of November coming up on Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be a tough stretch here, Horwat. It is going to be a tough stretch, but it's still that point early enough in the season where if they just happen to string together the right couple of wins, let's say they win all three, um, then they have 21 points, and they're all of a sudden tied for third in the division. Although, of course, that discounts every other team in the division not winning. Yeah, But you understand what I'm saying. It is still that point of the season where just a couple of wins, and all of a sudden, we're right back in this. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what made those five points on the last road trip so important. The only issue was we didn't move. So now we got to pick up those wins and actually make some moves on these standings because uh, mm -hmm. we're a little bit behind the eight ball at this point. You know, we're getting into that game 20 mark, that quarter mark, like you said. We can't be behind the eight ball too much longer, else it will get dangerous. That panic button isn't getting hit, but man, it might be, we might be looking at it. Might be glancing over and saying, there it is, guys. Let's, let's know it's there. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Connor Bedard button is right next to it. Yeah, you got Howie Mandel sitting there saying, listen, panic or no panic, the door is open. It's your decision as of right now. Everybody's still still closing it, but they're closing it a little slowly. There's no slamming the panic button off. It's still on, and it, it's still a slight close for a lot of people. But, no, the Pittsburgh Penguins, listen, not many people look at the standings until American Thanksgiving. That's when a lot of people start looking and saying, okay, it's kind of where teams make sense. I mean, you look at the Buffalo Sabres. They were red hot to start the season. They've lost seven in a row in regulation. 
That's why you wait until Thanksgiving, at least American Thanksgiving, to really look at these standings and take anything uh, of that for an actual stat. But the three games this weekend, starting with Minnesota, let's talk about that a little bit. No Mark andre Fleury for the Wild, so it's not going to be back-to-back games against former Stanley Cup champion goaltenders for the Penguins. He is on the injured reserve. But with Minnesota and then again in Winnipeg, these are two bigger teams. They're heavier teams that like to play the game a little bit more methodically, similar to what the Penguins are going to have to change their game to in order to get wins this season. So in that instance, I do think that these games lean a little bit more towards what the Penguins need to do, which is slow the game down and play with your speed. Kind of what you saw them do with the Washington Gate uh, Capitals. You are the faster team simply because the other team is slow. So you need to take advantage when you can because – other than that, the Penguins went up against Toronto. They're slower than Toronto. Mm-hmm. They went up against Montreal. They're slower than Montreal. You need to take advantage when you're playing these games against these bigger plotting type teams where you do still have a slight speed advantage. Yeah, if you you got to take that small advantage when you get it because, like we said before, this team isn't fast anymore, and they have to start adjusting their game to uh, whatever new style they need to play or whatever – yeah, or for every style they need to play. And the Winnipeg Jets are a perfect example of, okay, use your speed game. You still have a little bit of it. It's not the worst, it's not the greatest, but you still have something there. Uh, utilize it because when you are the faster team, you are the much better team. So uh, take advantage of it in Winnipeg, especially the Winni- Winnipeg Jets team that, yeah, they're 9 4 1 right now, but man, should they be? They're, they're one of those weird teams that are, you know, unexpectedly good right now. Mm-hmm. they are and it, a lot of it has been on the head of Connor Hellybuck like if, if he yeah. is in net on Saturday that is going to be a tough matchup for the Pittsburgh Penguins a team that has struggled in finishing and a lot of their scoring has come from one line that's really when you need both of your top six lines to be clicking on all cylinders getting all the scoring opportunities because your bottom six is going to be tough for them or the defense to factor in in the scoring against a guy that sees the puck really well and has been doing so all season long so in these three games I think the order of the toughness, obviously Winnipeg right now is the highest in the standings of the three, but I think Minnesota is your toughest game. They always play the Penguins very hard. I know Sidney Crosby usually finds success against Minnesota when it's on home ice, but on the road, these three games, it's going to be difficult, not to mention the fact that they're three games in quick succession. I've said it over and over again, but that's because of how much the Penguins have played in these spurts. They had like a week where they played only one game in seven days, but then it's just been back-to-backs and three games in four days on loop for the entire month of November. And they need, honestly, they need at least two wins. And I might go as far as saying they need another five points out of six points on this road trip like they did last time. I mean, to be to be obvious, they just need as many points as possible. I like the idea of five. I love the idea of six. Two wins Two wins flat, four. I think I'll take four, depending on how that uh, that clean loss looks and goes. Like, do, is it a loss that builds momentum? Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, a, it also depends on which team it's against. If they lose to Minnesota, okay, again, we're that's the first game. We're creeping toward that panic button a little more again. But also then you rebound and win two more against Winnipeg and Chicago, and you pull away, but then you look at Chicago and go, oh, yeah, you're supposed to beat them. <laughs> um so it also depends on which loss you take, but mm-hmm. um, ideally, yeah, five to six would be great. Uh, we'll, I think we'll be okay with four, depending on how the loss looks. Well, you mentioned that, and especially with Tristan Jari de- dealing with physical issues, uh, we don't know what that is. You know he's going to have to draw in for one of those games over the weekend, so you know you're already going to be playing with a partially injured goaltender. That makes this Minnesota game tonight I mean, I don't know if DeSmith will start or if Jari will start. That makes this Minnesota game tonight that much more important because it is difficult to win back-to-back games on the road. And you might say Chicago sucks. That's still a tough place to play. Yeah, like The Matt absolutely. House on Madison, even though that team is fully on a rebuild and they are so far away from contending for anything, that is a difficult place to go in and win a hockey game, even if the team is not as good, which is where they're at right now. They also still have some players. I mean, as of right now, Patrick Kane hasn't been traded yet. Andreas Athanasio, pretty good player. Max Domi can come up and have a really good game out, out of nowhere, even though he's very inconsistent as a player. They still have some good players that can beat you. And let's not forget the fact that the Pittsburgh Penguins are also not a very good team right now. So no t- no games taken for granted. The Penguins need at least four points. That's what I heard out of this segment. 
They need yeah. at least four. And if they want to do that, the biggest thing is going to be starting off hot tonight against Minnesota, a team that's missing their starting goaltender. Yeah, it's you got to start off the uh, start off the proper way. Getting off of the win in Minnesota is the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to discuss a little bit is that Chicago game, because when I look at this weekend, that's the game I'm I'm kind of most intrigued to see what the Penguins do, because as we already said, Chicago they're not going to be competing for anything other than Connor Bedard this year. Like that's where they're at in their organization. I mean, they spent a lot of money on Seth Jones last year, questionably. Uh, they set, spent nothing on Mark Andre Fleury and then got something. So I guess that's just good asset management, but this is a team that is holding on to old glory with uh, Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves. Who knows if they're going to get traded this year, but they're really just feeding the bottom of the barrel looking to hopefully and potentially get a game changer in Connor Bedard. So I see this game as a litmus test for the Penguins. You need to go out there and destroy a team like this. You know, as, as, as weird as it may seem, if they don't destroy this Chicago team, I know it's on the second half of a back-to-back. I know it's the third game in four days. I know it's on the road. Malkin's going to get up for this game because that's going to be his 1,000th game. We'll talk about that in the last segment. Crosby just needs to get up for all three of these games because of how bad his lines perform. Same with Jake Gensel, same with Brian Rust. Jason Zucker has been on overdrive for over a week and a half at this point. You know, he might slow down, but even a little bit of a regression to the mean is still really good Jason Zucker. And you have Teddy Bluger getting back into the swing of things, fresh legs on him. So you know what you really need? You need to go out there. And obviously the first two games are really tough but you need to go out there and you need to wipe the floor with the Chicago Blackhawks on Sunday. I need to see that from this team. Yeah. It'll, it'll be the second half of the back-to-back with travel, but you do need to um, take full advantage of a not very good team of a team that despite the place in the standings, again, it's early. Like I said, the Penguins could win two games and be back up where they want to be. Whereas the Blackhawks could lose one and be in last in the division. Yeah. So they're don't look at the place in the division. Just know that they're not a great team. And yes, second half of the back-to-back, but you got to find that old form where you were putting up six on guys. Find the sixth goal. Find a seventh goal. Just pop off for a game and really build your momentum back to make you look like one of the most dangerous teams in the NHL. That is, I mean, through the first five, the Penguins were 4-0-1, all four of their wins coming with six goals. Mm -hmm. They looked like one of the better teams in the league, looked like the most dangerous team in the league. They could outscore you. They were and they were able to shut you down too. That Tristan Jari was on his game at the beginning of the season. Yeah. Um, but now it's not that. Ever since that losing streak, yeah, they picked up five points, but something just felt off still, right? Like, am I the only one that felt that? Like, yeah, they got a couple of wins and that overtime loss, but there was something still like weird in the air where, where it was this doesn't feel correct. Yeah. Yeah, they got points, but yeah. So make it. But get that funk out of you. Make mm-hmm. it deter- like make it a determined win. Make it a an obvious we're back, get ready sort sort of win. You got some difficult games ahead of you. Calgary's coming. Philadelphia's always gonna be interesting. And Toronto's coming back. So find what you can do. Mm-hmm. Get into it. Yeah. Uh definitely you wanna see them scoring goals, but more importantly, I think it in my opinion, when you look at this roster. Sometimes it's not constructed to score a lot of goals. What you need to do, though, if you're not going to score a lot of goals, is prevent a lot of goals, and they haven't been doing that. They need to be better in their own zone, more responsible, more sure on uh, on zone exits, more sure on that first pass from defenseman that has been kind of shaky again uh, after a couple better games. You need to be sure in your own zone because these goaltenders, listen, overall this season haven't been good enough. The Smith has played good enough the last couple of games. Mm-hmm. He has. I mean, there were times in, in that Toronto game where I said, you know what, the Smith, you're out of position again. Like this is, but there were times he needed to be because the defense was just not there for the Pittsburgh Penguins. So they need that a little bit better. And then for those who who didn't really get the the gravity of what Horwat said earlier, they're, the Chicago Blackhawks are like one game out of last place in their division. Yeah. For those that don't pay attention to the entire National Hockey League, that's one game out from the Arizona Coyotes. And I don't know if that's a language that, all hockey fans can seek that anybody that is that close to the coyotes in the standings is just not good. Put it this way. The central division right now isn't phenomenal. It's got the Colorado avalanche. Yes, but they're currently behind the Dallas stars and Winnipeg jets. 
Yeah. Yeah. Both of those teams surprising too, but yeah. um, nonetheless, uh, you need to beat Chicago and it all starts this, this evening uh, with the Minnesota wild. You need to get off to a good start on this road trip. Like you did last week against the Washington capitals. They got off to a good start and that kind of set the tone for the, for the road trip. So you need to see a really good performance tonight uh, before we head to a quick break. Horwat, we're not going to go game by game. What do you predict as the record for the Pittsburgh Penguins over the next three? I'll give them their two and one, two and one, four points, not six, not five, not six, but four. I think just we'll scrape it in. Okay. Two and one. And uh, we'll roll from there. We'll come back home, come back, come back home and see what we can do with that. Mm-hmm. And just out of, out of curiosity, if you had to pick one game, they would lose. Uh, Probably Winnipeg. Don't know why. Okay. Just throws it in the middle. Yep. I'm going to also say they go two and one and, and collect four points. I think they lose tonight's game though to Minnesota. So I'm going to say two and one as well, but I have them losing to the Minnesota wild. Although again, I, I do think that you can lose this game and get enough momentum to go into the weekend and win those back-to-back games. So that's what I want to see yep. from the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's what I expect to see from the Pittsburgh Penguins, but something that we 95% knock on wood chance see is Genny Malkin hitting game number 1,000 over the weekend. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to discuss that a little bit before we say goodbye today. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm Berlansky, that's Horwat, and we're talking about Evgeny Malkin, almost to 1,000 career games. He is right now at 997. Yeah, so tonight will be 998. 999 should be on Saturday against Winnipeg, and then Big old game number 1,000 against the Chicago Blackhawks. An interesting uh, an interesting matchup for that. You know, I was thinking about it, and I said, kind of sucks that it's on the road, and it still does. But I was like, and it's against the Blackhawks, which is, you know, it doesn't mean as much. It's not against a rival. It's not against Ovi. It's not against you know, anybody in particular. And I was like, well, it is against the Blackhawks, though. And for a long portion of his career, the comparison was Taves and Kane versus Crosby and Malkin. So I guess there is a little bit of a story to go there, even though, like we mentioned in the last segment, the Blackhawks aren't going anywhere this year. Shoot, the Penguins might not be going anywhere this year either, but at least the Penguins were expected to go somewhere. Uh, So Malkin heading towards game number 1,000 potentially against the Chicago Blackhawks on Sunday. You talked to Sidney Crosby about that, and we'll get to that audio here in a second. But what does that mean to you? that Evgeny Malkin is going to hit game number 1,000. What do you think that means for his legacy? It means a, it means a lot. I mean, if you look at some of the greatest Penguins in the franchise history, it's uh, he's up there now, obviously. I mean, Crosby and Malkin will be the only two players until Chris Tang gets it um, to reach that number. Mario Lemieux never hit it. Yager didn't hit it here. Um, and everyone else kind of got traded in and out. Those are like the only two real long-term players excuse me, in this franchise's history, it's a number that doesn't get hit often. And like Crosby said, it's like a lot of guys, a lot of great players don't hit that number. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the greatest players never hit that number. I don't think Forsberg, obviously Lemieux didn't. I just said that. Uh, who else didn't? I don't think Eric Lindros ever did. Bobby Orr didn't come Bobby anywhere Orr. close. That's what I was trying to think of. I don't I don't think Mike Bossy ever did. Like some of the greatest names of this sport never hit that number. And then obviously the other greatest names obviously did. And Malkin's now going to have his name uh, up there with him. It's Mm -hmm. an important achievement for any hockey player, any NHL player. And uh, they don't have to be good or bad. They hit a thousand games. That is something. They are notable. Yeah. Longevity in any professional sport is impressive in its own right. Let alone longevity and still being as effective as a guy like Evgeny Malkin. This is his 17th season in the National Hockey League. This year, he has 16 games played, 17 points, including seven goals. He is tied for second on the team in goals, and he is tied for first on the team in points. Not only is Evgeny Malkin about to hit 1,000 games, but he has been a difference maker, a playmaker in almost every game that he has played in. He is a freak of nature, a future Hockey Hall of Famer, and hitting 1,000 games, like you mentioned, only the second Pittsburgh Penguin to ever do so. 
So I know a lot of people are saying, uh, it's just playing. It's not like, you know, anything that, but it's, it's very important. And it's, there's a reason that this is always such a celebrated moment in hockey is because it is a difficult thing to do. Whether you're in there as a guy like Patrick Marlowe, who is just consistently above average, or you're a guy like Evgeny Malkin, who has been to the top of the mountain. I mean, 2007 Calder Trophy. That's something Crosby can't say. <laughs> he has two Art Ross trophies. He has a Con Smythe trophy. He has a Hart trophy. He has a Lester B. Pearson award. The guy is decorated. And the guy is a historic figure, not only in the Penguins organization, but in the National Hockey League. So congratulations to Evgeny Malkin. Preemptively, preemptively, we expect him to hit it on Sunday. He's lined up to hit it on Sunday. We'll see what happens with that. But before we give our closing thoughts on this. We'll talk about it again on Monday's episode after it happens. But after we, before we give our closing thoughts, we'll let you hear from Sidney Crosby because Nick Horwat asked him the question on Wednesday following Penguins practice. Here's Crosby on Evgeny Malkin hitting 1,000 games. It's an awesome achievement. And uh, given what he's gone through to, to get to it too, um, you know, a lot of guys might not have been playing at this point, having to play through what he has. So uh, I think it's, it's an achievement in itself, but especially what, what he's had to go through to get there. You've been around a lot of superstars in your time. Just like, how, how unique is Gino's like, personality for you know the caliber of player that he is, but for him to also be just so funny and like, yeah. humorous? Like, how, how special is that? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it firsthand for a long time. So, um, you know, it's, it's great that energy that he brings. and. It's, it's unique and, and it's him. So, um, yeah, I mean, superstar or not, I think uh, you always love having personalities like that on your team. That was Sidney Crosby's thoughts on his teammate, and longtime friend of Genny Malkin, hitting 1,000 games played. Good job uh, by you, Horwat, and tag team, and with Michelle Crecchiolo of Penn's Inside Scoop to get that quote. But with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, I mean, one of the best dynamic duos in the history of hockey. Uh, and before we get out of here, we don't want to we don't want to say everything because we want to talk a little bit about it on Monday. Uh, but with Evgeny Malkin hitting that 1,000th game, what do you want to see him do in that game? Like, do you want to <laughs> see something special from Malkin against that Blackhawks team? Don't you always? You always want to see something special. I mean, we can remember. I forget was it, was it Ovechkin's 1,000th game against us, and he scored like in the first 10 seconds. It was some some moment like that where uh, Ovechkin was on the verge of a milestone, playing the Penguins in Washington, and just hit it in the first 10 seconds um you know just just a solid game and i think that'll be easy to come by considering his line of uh he and zucker and whether it's or keller russ has been the best line this team has seen uh this season so far so i think just a solid game from him will be enough for us i want a hat trick <laughs> i'm gonna get selfish i want a hat trick listen this pittsburgh penguin season has had ups and has had much more downs. I want to see Evgeny Malkin notch a hat trick. That could be the only three goals of the game for the Penguins. That's fine. Like, I want more. But I want to see Evgeny Malkin get a hat trick. The last time he got a hat trick, it was on a Sunday against an original six team. So let's see him do it again. Let's see him do it again. Um, but that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg. We'll be back on Monday to talk about, hopefully, a hat trick and three straight wins uh, for the Pittsburgh Penguins and Evgeny Malkin. But we will see you then. Have a great weekend, Penn's fans.